at some of them and say, this stuff is all agile BS. So, so they've come up with this document that has, that has a series of questions that you need to ask about your scrum, like can your scrum team deliver working product every sprint, including the first sprint? <clears throat> if the contract says they're gonna do that, agile. If not, it goes to the agile BS bucket and they're recommending that purchasing reject the contract. And similarly, they've got uh, similar questions. Is your development agile, but your deployment waterfall? If so, agile BS bucket, reject, reject that. <laughs> okay, so it's a really good serious, a serious series of questions now to ask scrum teams because there's so much agile BS out there. So one of the remedies for Agile BS is to try to implement Scrum at scale. And what we're working on this week is a, actually a meta framework that talks about the pieces of a large scale Scrum. We work with the biggest ones in the world. Uh, Amazon has 3,300 Scrum teams, SAP has 2,000. Uh, I don't know how many Intel has, but maybe more than SAP. <coughs> And on the right-hand side of the circle, the red, is the product, what we call the product owner cycle, the things that the product owner needs to be concerned about. And we look at how is that implemented, how does it work, how well is it functioning. And on the left-hand side, we have what we call the scrum master cycle, all the pieces that the scrum masters need to worry about. And what we want to do is use scrum to scale scrum and tune it up so that the organization increases its value. That means if it's publicly traded, the stock price goes up. Now Rob Froman, who is usually here, uh, who leads this Agile Working Group, was at Pega Systems when we introduced Scrum there. Do we have any people from Pega? Yeah. While we're introducing Scrum, the stock price goes up 400%. That's what we like to see. So I've been working with a venture capital group here in Boston for the last over 10 years now. They run Scrum at scale for all their companies. They want everybody doing Scrum everywhere. And they use Scrum everywhere themselves. Their goal is to double the return on investment compared to competitive venture capitals. And they're consistently doing that. So, this really works, it's been tried out. And now we're trying it out in a restaurant. So what do you think happened to Ricardo as soon as he booted up Scrum in the restaurant? <coughs> Even what I just said. He doubled his bottom line. Investing groups are now about to fund two new Scrum restaurants. Why? Because he gets twice the return and half the time in the restaurant business. I'm going to talk to you about how he thought about this. His problem was that expenses were increasing. It is, you know, when he started, 25% of it was payroll. By last year, or 2017, it's up to 39%. And it's a very competitive market in the restaurant business. The margins are thin. It's very difficult to raise prices. So his margins are getting squeezed. And if you look at his annual, annual budgeting, there's some months where he expects to lose money, other months he makes more money. Uh, but it's getting worse and worse. I mean, the margins are getting squeezed more every year. So he, he's like, I either need to do something different or I'm going to be exiting the restaurant business. That's what he's thinking. That's why so, so many restaurants close down. I mean, they're, they're always still opening up and they're always closing down, right? There's huge turnover in restaurants because of this problem. Now, Ricardo says the restaurant business is really broken. And it's broken uh, because of the way it's run. It's an abusive industry that treats their employees terribly. 
and decent people promoted to management positions become megalomaniacs virtually 100% of the time in the restaurant business. It happens in the software world too, right? And if you have one of those people working for, <laughs> some of you are nodding yes. <laughs> yeah. they, they, it's, it's as though they think it's expected they would rule with an iron glove and everyone would just be servants to them in their mastery, right? And you know, they started out working with customers, but now that they're a manager, they sit in the back room and push a bunch of papers around and don't do anything useful other than order people around and making life miserable. So this is basically the restaurant business. Virtually everywhere it's like this. Now Ricardo read the book twice work and half the time. And he said, you know, this might work in the restaurant. He took it and he gave it to his restaurant manager. She asked her to read it. She took it home and read it. Came in the next morning and quit. She said, I want to be a manager who can order people around and tell them what to do. In this book, I, I don't get to do that. I'm out of here. Okay. So if the manager wanted to treat people like slaves, so that she can feel good in her superiority and self-aggrandizement. It's a very interesting book written by Kathleen Rosenthal uh, discussing how slavery inspired modern business management. Something to really think about. And it's everywhere. Here's a, here's a senior vice president of an oil company. And we have scrum teams out running the oil rigs. <laughs> Some of them work for her. <clears throat> and she said to me, I was in London, the headquarters is in London. I was in London talking to some of the leadership and she grabbed me in the hallway and she said, Jeff, before scrum I worked nights and weekends. We couldn't get anything done, but I had no mercy. You know, I had over a thousand people working for me and I pushed them night and day. They called me the ice cream. She said, now we work a normal work week and we're really getting the stuff done. He said, you not only gave me my life back, you gave me my soul. So some of those managers out there that are acting like they don't make they have a very deep problem that's more than just their daily misery. And some of them are waking up to a solution to that problem. Now, one of the things about Scrum that Ricardo learned very quickly is that it's based on medical research and massive uh, computing of modeling the human cell and figuring out how a system works and in small increments changes states. And so my PhD thesis, my goal was, uh, Dr. Bale was my thesis, one of the leading cancer researchers in the world, and he said, Jeff, we need to figure out what causes cancer. We need to model it on the computer. And, it's, and, when we, and we need to know exactly what steps cause a cell to transform. And when we know that, we'll know how to intervene. And then uh, maybe we can make, make some progress on this problem. Okay. So we had to understand complex adaptive systems. Well, it turns out that a person is a complex adaptive system. A team is a complex adaptive system. A restaurant is a complex adaptive system. So is, the, so is this institute. It's a complex adaptive system. So if you understand this on the small, you, it's the same thing at scale. So what we want to do, both on the technical side but also on the organizational side, is we want to look at how can we make a small intervention into a system such that that intervention ripples through the system and pushes the system towards a new capability. And then we want to run the system, see if it got better, 
didn't get better, we're going to pull out that change and then ask, okay, how can we implement it next time? In all the years I've been teaching Scrum, the only people that really got this <laughs> were the architects at Google. They cornered me one night in a New York restaurant. They would not let me leave until they understood the secret of Scrum. And at 10, after 10 o'clock at night, after paying me with questions for four hours, they said, we got it. It's all about understanding the architecture of the system. The whole team has to ask, what's the next change we make? To do that, they need to understand enough about the system to know where they should make that change. Then the system needs to be running all the time. And then they need to ask the question where to make the next change. And that might be in a totally different part of the system. Systematically do that, doing that will give you 10 times the innovation and deliver in one tenth the time. Forget about twice the work and half the time. This, doing this well will uh, really accelerate you. So in order to do this, you need self-management. So this is one of the things that Ricardo's wrestling with the restaurant. How does he get people to self-management? Teams need to swarm all together to figure out what to do and also to do it. So how does he generate swarming in the restaurant? Uh, incentives need to change. You know, his restaurant, just like in many other organizations, particularly in software, we have these specialists, right? I was hired to be, do this one specialized thing, and I don't do anything else. And just as in many industries in the restaurant business, the bartender's hoarding his skill set, right? He doesn't want anybody else knowing how he mixes that drink because his longevity as an employee and pay raise depends on it. So we have this hoarding of information. So how is, how is uh, Ricardo gonna fix that? <clears throat> Uh, one of the things he realized very quickly is that the whole economic structure of the restaurant needs to be visible and people need to get a piece of the action or they will not be incented to work together. So the whole way you run a business and involve the employees needs to radically change. And people need to grow. People always ask, I mean we get this question all the time, well, if there's only product owners and scrum masters and team members in scrum, then what's my growth path? What's my career path? Well, in the restaurant, it's really interesting. It says, the career path, I'm gonna teach you how to run a scrum restaurant. You're gonna become cross-functional and learn every single job well enough that we can then send you out and you can launch your own restaurant. <laughs> so your career path is you become a restaurant owner. And you boot up your own restaurant, you make a lot of, you make twice the money in half the time <laughs> compared to other restaurants. Now, another thing we know about Scrum is every time we go into an organization, the first thing we want to do is we want to get right to the top and say, okay, we want to prioritize every project in the organization, every initiative, every project, every product. And we want to see what is the most important, what's the least important. And every time we do that, the things at the bottom 30% of the list, the leadership looks at that and says, why are we doing that? We had an IT services firm do that, and they realized the bottom 30% was Windows 7 support, and almost everybody had gone to Windows 10. In one afternoon, they freed up 300 people. So I was really interested in seeing how this was going to play out in the restaurant. You know, is this true in the restaurant? Because I've seen in every company we've gone in, we've seen that. So I wanted to see: is this in a restaurant? Well, when the manager quit, <laughs> then Ricardo said, "Well, <clears throat> the manager used to spend spend a day a week figuring out who is on the shifts in the restaurant." 
and uh, uh, so now who's going to do the sh who's going to figure out the shifts? I better get the whole team together in front of a board and have them figure out the shifts. So he gets them in the front of the board, and in one hour, the restaurant team as a whole plans out three weeks of shifts, and they find that a third of the shifts that the managers had been scheduling were not necessary. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? This is why restaurants have so, such a hard time making money. A third of the shifts they have are like they're just paying people to waste their time. And this is true in your company too, if you haven't done this. Every company you've gone into is doing it. They always complain to me, oh, we have so much stuff to do, we don't have enough people to do it. How many in a company like that? Oh, we have so much to do, we have no... <laughs> As soon as you prioritize things, you free up a third of the people. Okay, if you had a third of your people freed up tomorrow, would that be enough to do what you need to do? It's a good start. Then, then you can go after the, we know in the software world, two -thirds of the, about two thirds of the features are never or rarely used by the user. And the same is true in the hardware world. Have you, have you ever gotten in one of these old cars? I drive Teslas. Every once in a while, I have to rent a car. Now, now I'm getting in this car. And I, first of all, I have to figure out how we turn it on. Sometimes it's a key. Like, why do you need this key thing? But anyway, some of them have, actually have keys. And, and some of them, you have to hunt around. They have this on button. So I get in the car, there's two useless features already before I've even done anything. And, and then, some of them actually have a brake that you have to release the parking brake, right? That, that is so 1950s. <laughs> <laughs> now there's three features. I remember I rented a brand new Prius in Washington. You know, I wanted to be uh, ecological. And I went through all the useless features getting it running, but the really bad thing was when I stopped it because I started walking away. You know, the Tesla, you just get out, walk away, it locks the door, turns on the brake, shuts off the lights. Everything's automatic, right? It's like your iPhone, sort of. But the Prius, I hear, is still running. So I go back, like, this thing is like, how do you turn it off? There's no off button. <laughs> Finally, I figure out, maybe if I push the on button, it turns off. I push it, and the sound stops. <laughs> but now I'm worried, like, is there a parking brake that I have to set? Maybe this thing doesn't turn off the lights, and that will burn out, you know, burn out the battery. It takes me 10 minutes to get this damn thing parked, because of all these useless features. So just as in software and hardware, we have all these useless features. So it's going to be interesting to see in the restaurant. <laughs> what are the useless stuff that we are doing in the restaurant? Well, the next thing that Ricardo was really interested in, he had gone to our Scrum Master training. He actually followed us around the world. He went with the Scrum Master training with uh, I think I originally with Joe Justice, one of the guys, the hardware guy that works with us. And then I think he went to Henry Nieberg in Sweden, and then he went to mine, <laughs> and then he went to product owner training, and he kept on doing that because he said, I gotta figure out this for the restaurants. So I need to I need to go around and train with the best people in the world multiple times so I, I get this enough that I know how to implement it in a restaurant. And one of the things he picked up was Swarming is really important. People collaborating to get stuff done. And so he was trying to figure out how to do that. He read uh, General McChrystal's book, Team of Teams. General McChrystal was brought into Iraq when we were losing the war. And he said, we can't have these command and control environments. We can't even have teams that are specialized. We need to have cross-functional teams that are led by a team of teams that if a piece of intelligence 
is picked up, a strike can be completed in less than 45 minutes. So once he was able to do that, there were 6,000 people on the team. Once he was able to do that, the terrorist incidents immediately dropped to zero. Okay, so Ricardo's reading about this team of teams. How do I set up my restaurant as a team of teams? He also, in scrum, he, he knew from scrum training why so many scrum teams suck. Okay. What percent of scrum teams in the world suck? There's really good data from the Spanish group on 50,000 project sets, each of which has 8 to 25 projects, and it shows that over 50% of the Agile projects are late, over budget, with unhappy customers. And about 8% of them are never deliver anything. So almost 60% of Scrum teams suck. There are very specific reasons why they suck. <laughs> and so what we've done in the, in the patterns movement is come up with patterns that are guaranteed to make your Scrum fast, easy, and fun. How many people have fast, easy, fun scrum? Some of you. <laughs> the other teams, it's slow, hard, and painful. How many of you have those? At least as many as on the one side. So the good news is that we know exactly what makes you go to one side or the other. And it's 100% predictable. So that's what we teach in our training. You know, if you have small, stable, dedicated teams, that's going to get you started. If you have big, unstable teams, you are going to be miserable forever. If you have backlog that's ready, that's a pattern. It's really ready, it's clear, people know what to do, it's small. If you have bad backlog, that is a prescriptive prescription for unending misery. And on and on. Okay. So Ricardo really got this out of under his belt. He says, okay, we're going to implement all these patterns in the restaurant, the ones on the right side. So the first thing he ran into, he said, okay, teams are supposed to be cross-functional, self-organizing, self-managing, collaborative, small, but the bartender's hoarding his knowledge. What am I going to do? Well, what he did, I need to get them cross-training one another. So he decided, well, first of all, he had already figured out he really needs to give people a piece of the action. If we're going to make twice the money in half the time, we should give a little money to the people that are doing it, right? So he, he says to the people, we're going to give you, <clears throat> we're going to give the teams 25% of the profits. Every month, we're just going to pay it out. So, that, so now everybody has an incentive to make the restaurant work. But he said, not only that, we're going to give you unlimited vacation. The only condition is that if you go on vacation, somebody has to be able to cover your job. What do you think the bartender did? <laughs> Started training everybody. <laughs> so we could take a day off whatever we wanted. Some of these things are so simple. Uh, I was, somebody was talking about the Massachusetts government here we, uh, before we started the meeting. We, we trained a few hundred people in IT, and, and they, were, they were complaining that these guys are all specialists. And I said, well, show me your job descriptions. And every job description said, this person is a highly specialized person in this one and only one area. And I said, what if we gave everybody an extra $100 a month if they could work in a second area? If we could do that, how long would it take to have cross-functional people? They said, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, everyone would be cross-functional. <laughs> I said, well, you only got 300 IT people, 100 bucks a month, that's like $30,000 a month. And your budget for those 300 people is like, millions of dollars a month. 
That $30,000 is like rounding error in the accounting system. You see how easy it is to solve these things? Many of the things we talk about can be fixed tomorrow. It's just people need to think out of the box and think differently. Not only it's so surprising how once you understand how easy and how inexpensive it is to fix it. So that's what, that's what we did. Now the bartender is training the waitresses so we can go on vacation. So we had to think about a lot about agile management. Here's a slide actually from the government. Even the U.S. government is trying to go agile. You know, we need a whole different way of thinking about uh, hiring. We need to hire people for adaptability, innovation, speed, people who can work on teams. I remember when <coughs> uh, Patient Keeper, a local company, was a startup. No, I'm not Patient Keeper, but individual. Uh, a local company was a startup and went public in 1995. And they had huge amounts of money. I, I had been the founder of the company, but I had gone and worked in another company. They pulled me back in to implement Scrum. So I went to HR and I said, I need people, I need to hire people that can work on teams. And they said, well, he said, they said, you know, right now we're hiring people, the smartest people we can and assuming that you put them in a cube and you slide food under the, <laughs> under the wall. But we could just as easily hire you know, it's hard to hire those people, but it would be just as easy to hire a smart person that could actually work with a team as one that could sit in a cube and not talk to anybody. So that was easy, but it is a completely different hiring policy. The second thing I did is I said, we need to hire people that can actually put code, working production code in the bill on the day that they show up for work. Said to HR, we need to implement a code by five problem. Someone comes in at eight o'clock in the morning, the first day, at five o'clock, they have production code ready. It turns out to be just as easy to hire people that could do that as it is to hire people that can't do it. But you just make just different decisions in the hiring process. It's really interesting. So Ricardo had to think this. One of his first challenges on the recruitment and HR side was uh, two of his two of his employees were graduate students that were you know going back to school. They left, and a couple of other people uh, went went out to another restaurant. He lost four people in the front of the restaurant. You know, who were part of the staff, serving staff, like in one in one week. And he says his standard practice was then, you know, to go into the back office and, uh, you know, be calling and working and, you know, as, as hard as he could to try to find people, and, but not talking to the people in the, in the restaurant who were all wondering, you know, is this restaurant even going to work now? We're so understaffed. So he said, well, the scrum way would be to talk to the people about it and make the work visible. I, why don't we have a scrum board for hiring? So, he, uh, and he needed to do this quickly because morale was really <laughs> tanking in the restaurant. So, he put up a scrum board. He knew Henrik Nieberg had this uh, HR slide in his training course. We get a lot of HR groups that are running scrum. And so, he, he knew about that. So, he, he created his own. And, you know, who are the people we're going to follow? Who, when do they come in for an interview? Uh, do we try them out on a shift? And who's hired? And as soon as he did that, the, in the daily meeting, the team said, can we help? And he says, yes, of course. <laughs> so in short order, they hired three of the four people that they needed. So, you know, 80%. This is one of the things that managers don't understand. With Scrum, you do twice the work and half the time as a manager, right? So before, he had to hire all four people, but now he gets four people hired by hiring one person.
So now, instead of spending all his time hiring, he only has to spend 20% of the time hiring, and only then for like half the time that he would have. You see how that works? Do we have managers in here? Every manager should want Scrum as fast as possible. It, it, if implemented well, it can make you unbelievably productive and look like a hero in the, co in the company. That's what a lot of managers don't get. You know, they, they're just worried about, will I have a job if, I, if the Scrum teams are doing Scrum? The other thing they saw is defects really quickly. They saw some people, they fi figured out really quickly that some people were just not responding to their offer because the way they were framing the salaries in the, in the job descriptions was not, it was not giving the right impression. So by making that all visible and having everybody see that, they were quickly identifying the defects in the process and also <laughs> accelerating getting to done, right? See, people think that, we talk to people in all these other domains, they think they're different than software. It's, it's the same, right? In software, don't we find the defects faster? 